Amen. Can you, everybody hear me? Is everybody, is my voice coming through loud and clear? Yeah? Perfect. Perfect. Well, let's turn off this ambiance music. All right, well, as we get started, you see this handsome gentleman on the side here with a clipboard. Uh, he's going to hand out, a, if anybody wants to sign up for communications as to future events, things like that, I'm assuming, go ahead and sign up. Nope. Yeah. All right, well, thank you for coming. Is uh, my voice coming through not too loud, just right? Okay. Does that sound good, Justin? I actually want to have a round of applause for Justin. He's sort of the unspoken hero here. He sinks behind his desk as we applaud him. He's a true introvert. <laughs> well, welcome to, I think this is session number four we're doing, and today we're going to focus on critical race theory. It is one of the tools being used to transform our society uh, in this modern times. Now, who here is, was here in the first lecture or has seen the first lecture? And I spent some time describing the fact that our world it really is a product of what occurred in Europe in general, East and West, in the, between the 1500s and the 1900s. Now, Western Europe and America has now formed what's called the West. And both the Western world and the Eastern European world, Russia, shrugged off their monarchies between 15 to 1900. Now, in the East, they replaced their monarchs, their czars, with hundreds of monarchs in the shape of bureaucrats, autocratic rulers, and communist dictators. Whereas in the West, we eliminated the position entirely. We wanted no centralized power possible. And the way I've abbreviated it in the past is the old school way of doing things is Rex makes Lex. The king speaks, and what he says automatically becomes law, just like magic. Now, we found out through thousands of years of civilization that that, lends, that tends itself to mass corruption, and it's bad news for the regular people like me and you. The West's radical innovation was Lex will be Rex. So there is no Rex other than Lex, Lex meaning law. The law, and it was natural law, just like we've discovered over the years, you know, chemistry works because we have antibiotics. Physics works because we have combustible engines. We know something works when we get results in the real world with them. And we realize that civilization runs according to laws, just like chemistry and physics. And those laws essentially were the natural laws we put as our guiding force. Now, for you Christians who read your Old Testament, that'll sound familiar because that was the exact makeup of the Old Testament Israel. God said to the Jews, you will have no king. And he was reasoning behind that. And as a civilization, we're, we're finding out what the reasoning is. And he says it right there in uh, 1 Samuel 8, 1 Samuel chapter 8. He says, this is what the king will do if you call a king over yourselves instead of my just law. He will take the best of your land. He will take your, your young to war. He will basically pillage you, and that is a sort of symbolic gesture uh, that is true of all of history. Centralized rulers act like kings all the time, every time. So the, the West said no. Now, it was based off a theistic political theory. That's what led them to go that way, whereas Russia and Marxism and socialism is atheistic political theory. And if you read early Lenin, he makes no bones about it. He understands thoroughly that he was creating a purely atheistic political system and that ours was based on theism and therefore that was its inherent weakness and they expected us to fail. Now, as I said, the proof is always in the pudding. Here's two, a tale of two civilizations. On your left-hand side, 
is 1960s America, where the average house size was over 2,000 square feet, where the average house, household population was 4.5, and where one parent worked to support all of that in a 48-week work year. And the average work day was about 40 hours, like it is now. G head over to the other side of, of Europe, and you've got bread lines, okay? That is a stark difference. That is a civilization whose rules are bearing fruit of one sort versus another sort. Now, Marxists like Herbert Marcuse were still not convinced that we had it right. They expected us actually to have a worker's revolution because they genuinely expected our system to fail. So guys like Marcuse and Theodore Adorno, part of the Frankfurt School, got here in the 50s and they began to preach the gospel of Hegel, Marx, and Engel. And essentially, they basically said, what's going to happen here is we need to replace Western values. We need to replace Western values with socialist values because that is the, going to be the way of the future. Now, <clears throat> make no mistake, this is, their, this is what the Frankfurt School guys were saying. Socialism is precisely the religion that must overwhelm Christianity. Now, what you're, you're, a tremendous amount is said in just that one sentence. They're saying this. They've analyzed the theistic political structure of the West, and they've determined that it is based on what? Christianity. It's not just that we have a better fiscal policy in the West. It's that our root ideology, as people have said, is Athens meets Jerusalem. The, sort of, uh, auto, the systems that Rome and Greece had perfected for administration were still used in the West, but they were breath, breathed into it the life of the ethos and the pathos of Judeo-Christianity. They recognized it, they thought that was a weakness, not a strength, and they expected it to fail. So they said we must replace it and we'll do so slowly through the institutions of education. So we'll, they started being, they basically, you could find the Frankfurt School guys sort of in the dank, dark hallways of academia in the 50s and 60s. But as their ideology permeated further and further outwards, we're now in 2022, we're living through two full generations of people having been educated, whether they realize it or not, in the Frankfurt School of Economics, Policy, and Politics, K through 12 through university. And this is why you'll see as we play this out that the exact ideology these guys prescribed is playing itself out in real time. Now, if you look at the Black Panther movement, they are an unabashed, you look at all their literature, they'll say it every single time from the 60s onwards. They were a Marxist, Leninist organization because the Frankfurt School knew they could not appeal to the working class to spread socialism. That's what they had done back in Russia in the Bolshevik Revolution because there was such a disparity between the czars and the landowners and the peasant farming class that you could easily drum up opposition between the oppressors and the oppressed. Fast forward to post-World War II America where the largest, wealthiest middle class in history had been created. They looked around and they said, we're not going to wait around for a workers' revolution here. It's not going to come anytime soon. But who was disenfranchised in 50s and 60s in America? The black population. So they zeroed in there and they, but trust me, these people, these Frankfurt School people had the same zeal as Christian missionaries do when they go overseas. They believed they were spreading a gospel of salvation. So they started to inform the, the black intellectuals and activist class, who then started to follow along in suit of what's called critical theory. Critical theory is quite simply the Marxist revolution coming to the West, critiquing the West to show that it is inferior to socialist values. That is, in a nutshell, what critical theory is. In the 70s, in Harvard Law Schools, you started to see the term critical race theory, which was a byproduct of the fact that they started to apply their critical theory to the one truly oppressed class in the U.S. at the time, which was the black southern population. So critical race theory is the grandbaby of critical theory, which is aimed at one thing and one thing alone, like the gentleman in the slide before this one said, to replace any Christian ethics, which means the Western's base values, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Federalist Papers, the Charter of Human Rights, with socialist Marxist systems. 
Now you see at the bottom of the screen there, the gentleman here being pr prominently displaced and quoted on a Black Panther magazine is the communist dictator of North Korea at the time, Kim Il-sung. And if you look at any political propaganda by the Black Panther Party, they always align themselves with communism. Uh, you see this, the red star of communism there on uh, Black, Pan <coughs> Black Panther novels. Now, the, the co-founder of the BLM movement said, and this is, I could have actually showed you the video clip, said unabashedly, we're trained Marxists. They are the modern day manifestation of critical race theory, just like the Black Panthers were in the 60s and 70s. So in a sense, nothing has changed. What was another group that was disenfranchised in the 60s and 50s of United States of America? The LGBT community. They, were, they had no mainstream support. So they are also part of the group that was brought into the fold of critical theory, which is why when you see this flag prominently displayed, you see the LGBT community, the transgender community, and the black and brown is for the BIPOC or black indigenous people of color community. They've been lumped together and pressed into service to do what? To replace Western values of what is normal families, what are normal sexual habits, etc. And what started off as just a pride parade, right, has ended up being, over the years, was Pride Week, the first week of July, and now what do we have as well? The entire month of June is Pride Month, and you're starting to see now other days throughout the calendar year being turned over to Pride this or Pride that. Is it, did it stay put as one day in our calendar? Like, let's say Memorial Day, right? If you go and die for this country, or you have relatives who've died for this country, you have one day of the year in celebration of that, so that's Memorial Day. But you have now, what, 40 plus days dedicated to the Pride movement. It is growing on the calendar because it is meant to replace our normal standards. Now, not himself a Marxist, but definitely a socialist, Malcolm X displayed one thing. He displayed the beginning of critical race theory. And one of the basic points in critical race theory is that America, in its founding documents, Federalist Papers, the U.S. Bill of Rights, and the U.S. Constitution, is inherently racist. That is the claim and the belief of critical race theorists. And this is where he's, his quote, American society makes it next to impossible for humans to meet in America and not be conscious of their color differences. We're going to digest that over the next uh, 15 minutes. Now, the civil rights of 1964 essentially came and banned the discrimination in public, ba public spaces that based on ethnicity. Now, this was already illegal, by the way. What I'll show you is the founding documents of the United States, the U.S. Bill of Rights and Constitution, the wording itself, and the founding fathers said this themselves, they said much of the founding fathers had slaves themselves, but they said to each other, there is no basis in the Constitution for slavery. Like, this is an unconstitutional economy that's going on in our midst. It had been brought over to the New World by England. It was just a leftover practice of England, which had just transferred over to the New World, but it was a rubbing point against the Founding Fathers. So the Civil Rights Act simply reminded the South, because this is applied basically for the South of the US, which is the only place in America, by the way, that ever had slavery. It reminded them that it was unconstitutional, and they'd already, in the 1800s, after the Civil War, they'd done the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment to the Constitution to drive home the fact that it was unconstitutional already to discriminate based on race. The Civil Rights Act simply came in and says, we, do we have to remind you of the reminder of the fact that this is not legal in the United States. Now, in the 60s, you couldn't, if you were black, you couldn't go to theaters, you couldn't ride the bus in many places, you had to, you could not uh, work or go to school at higher education in, in many places, especially the South. So you had heartbreaking scenes like this, where you have a black, two black friends, what do they want to do? They want to eat at the counter like anybody else at a diner. And how are they being treated, right? How easy was it to find within this group who were truly being disenfranchised as a marching order group to begin a process in favor of critical theory. This is exactly what's, what happened. Um, any, anybody here know of, the, know of the term freedom writers? 
you couldn't, in, in many states, you couldn't take the bus, interstate buses or st bus within the states for long distances. It was illegal in, for blacks to do so in parts of the south. Well, black and white activists would get on the bus anyways and specifically go to these places, then they'd be pulled out and beaten, right? So there was racial discrimination in the South, in the U.S., up until the 60s and beyond. So there, there's no doubt that racism in some form was a problem in our society. The question is, is it built into our founding documents, or did it slip in through human sin, despite the fact that our founding documents said it wasn't natural law to have slavery? That's the question I want to answer. Was America truly founded on racism? Now, first of all, what is race? Uh, it's a bit of a misnomer, because in biology, two different species can't breed together. So I don't know of any two human ethnicities that can't breed together. So the idea of multiple human races is actually a misnomer. All ethnicities can breed, therefore there is only one race, and it is human. Now, just as much as... Um, here's our... He, theistic political theory lent, lent us to have the West. Lex makes Rex, over Rex is Lex. In the same way, there's a huge difference when you have a theistic view of biology and human anthropology versus an atheistic view of it, and I'll show you why. In the first chapter of Genesis, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, there was patriarchal language base in the ancient Hebrew, but if you look at it logically, what it's saying is humanity reflects God's image perfectly. And it is based into two half circles that come together to form a full circle of God's image. Male, female. So sexism, grammatically, is out of the question theologically. And obviously, ethnically, we come from the same two human parents. The entirety of the genome for all human expression was contained in parents we all share. Okay? This is the difference, because if you're, for example, if you look at late 1800s, early 1900s era Darwinist theory, they saw, they had the multi-regional hypothesis of human evolution, which meant that humans evolved in different parts of the world at different times, emanating from the hominid species, which meant that some species were maybe 100,000 years behind us in evolution. And the idea that the Greeks were the epitome, the Greek or European, the Euro-Caucasus ethnicities were at the peak and furthest reaches of evolution. Now, if that doesn't give you all sorts of license for evolution, or sorry, for racism, I don't know what does. You see the inherent difference in a theistic view of biology anthropology, right? And ironically, over time, the, the neo-Darwinian theory on evolution has positioned it way more towards a singular region of hypo singular hypothesis, hypothesis of our origins. In other words, they're now realizing that somewhere in Northeast Africa or the Mediterranean or Mesopotamia, which ironically happens to be close to home for us who believe in the Garden of Eden, is the area where a, a singular act of evolutionary leap took place to deliver the human race. So it's, science is bending its arc towards a more theologically friendly view of human origins. But a hundred some odd years ago, it lent itself quite easily to racism. Now your DNA is wrapped up in your chromosomes. Now what makes us different? Because sometimes you get a mutation inside of you. Think of human DNA like, like this. By the way, you get one chromosome from mom and one chromosome from dad. They come together. Think of it as two bookshelves facing each other. And each book is of the, it, you have a book for your eye color, a book for your bone density. For every aspect of your physiology and, and being, you have a book. And the mom book and the dad book are at the exact same place on the shelf facing each other. But your genetics read one versus the other. But you inherit something, a bookshelf from your mom and a bookshelf from your dad. Those books are called alleles. Alleles are chunks of DNA that code for something. Now, human beings have the exact same bookshelves, in the, exact, the books are in the exact same order regardless of your ethnicity. The only time you see differences in the human genome is through errors, mutations, and disease that have accumulated over time. The largest amount of difference ever discovered between two human speci specimens is 0.3%. Now, sorry, it's 0.1%. And that's, again, 
a book not in its right place through mutation or disease. Other than that, what you have is you have differences in alleles, eye color, hair color, skin thickness, muscle density, etc. There are ethnic bound differences based on alleles, but they're the same books in the same place on the same bookshelf. Now, a landmark study by the Stanford University in 2002, they broke up the world into basically seven different spots, and they compared the DNA from these different far reaches of the planet. Now, what they found was interesting, because 40% of us, no matter where you go on the world, in the world, we have 40% the same alleles, right? We we, some of them are recessive, some of them are dominant, but we all, no matter wh- if you go to Siberia versus South America, you see the same alleles about half the time. If you narrow it down to two or three regions close to each other, we share 92% of the same genetics. And then the only, only in 7.4% of alleles are they found only in one of those seven regions. Make a long story short, um, we're extremely similar. Now, there was a study done on three separate scientists, a genetic study. Two British scientists, Watson and Venter, with a Korean, a South Korean scientist. Now, they, when they t- and analyzed their DNA, although they look alike, the two British gentlemen, they were more alike genetically to the Korean than each other. So sometimes the differences we see on the surface are actually the minority of our genetic difference. We share more on the underlying genetics. All this to say, quite simply, that we are one human family. And by the way, do you know the only, there's only one molecule that codes for color of skin, hair, and eyes. It's melanin. We all have melanin, just in different concentrations. So the melanin difference creates a striking visual difference, but it represents an incredibly thin sliver of genetic difference. So basically, biologically speaking, racism is irrational, right? We can get that out of the way. Theologically and biologically, it is irrational. Now, there's two big sins placed against the West when it comes to critical race theory. Colonialism and slavery. That's off. That's the one-two punch to say our society is simply wrong. Started wrong, built wrong, should be done away with. Who would have the marked interest and belief that the West should be done away with? Marxism. Marxism is a th- the, athe- the most acutely atheistic political theory imaginable and devised, and therefore it is consistently at war with the most theistically devised political theory, which is the Western world. You're going to see the spiritual war clashing in this department because of those differences. So, colonialism. What is it? What, it, what did it look like? How bad was it? Etc. Now, The current theory of migration is that about 25,000 years ago, you guys see the big blue bubble in the top there? During the last ice age, there was a land bridge between Siberia and Alaska, and migratory patterns happened during that time. So these people came down through the top left. I call it top left entrance point. Now, when when the European colonialists came in the 14s, 15s, 1600s, we brought old world diseases to the new world and approximately 30 to 50% of the indigenous population in North America died. Now, again, that's colonialism's downfall, but that was accidental. That is not a moral, uh, that is not a moral problem with the West. That is just simply, ac- it could have gone the other way, too. We didn't know about microbiology in those days. We had no conception that this was possible. Now, <clears throat> when the Europe met the indigenous crowd, a, s- a few things took place. There is currently, in all of North America, Alaska, Canada, and U.S., not Mexico, about 6.7 million indigenous people in all of North America. Now, an American, a, um, an American Cherokee anthropologist by the name of Dr. Russell Thornton, he's the head of the anthropology department at UCLA, he did an estimate of what would have been the pre-Columbian, pre-Columbus, pre-European population total of the indigenous people in North America before we ever set foot on the continent. And he placed it somewhere between 3.8 to 7 million, which makes sense because if you look at their birth rates since we've been here, and you factor in that an approximate 30 to 50% of them passed away when we got here from disease, that makes perfect sense. Because you'll hear words like 100 million, things like that. And you'll hear that 90% of them died from exposure to smallpox and typhus, etc. 
But if you do that math, it does not account for the fact that their population has grown since that death rate. And if there was 100 million and 90% of them died, that's still 10 million to start from and grow from. It is not possible for some of these larger numbers to be true. So this is about the basic picture. Now, if you look at the entire North American continent, do you realize how little three to seven million people is for this large of a land mass, okay? It meant that this place was open for business. There was vacancy on this continental mass. And if you can enter stage left, is it inherently wrong to enter stage right in an essentially empty continent? Well, of course the answer is no. There's, there's no inherent problem. We had as much right to come here as they had to in the first place. The qu and they did not have much in terms of private property laws or e there are a lot of nomadic tribes. There was a lot of differences between our cultures. And for the most part, ironically, it went well for the most part. We just keep being replayed the negative highlights of what happened. And there were negative, hi negative highlights, which we'll look at it now. Now, before we got here, by the way, there is mounting evidence and only mounting evidence for the fact that the, we did not disrupt when we came here some form of hip hippie fest where they were just walking around in perfect harmony, smoking peyote, and having a great time. This is not the picture, the true picture of the history of the North American indigenous. There was a lot of warfare, intertribal warfare. There was ritual sacrifice. We find mass graves and evidence of what we would consider fairly barbaric torture. Okay? They had a different society, and it had its own problems, because as Christians know, what is ubiquitous across all of humanity, regardless of ethnicity? Sin. Exactly. You will find sin in about the same ratio in any civilization, no matter where you look at any given time. Different shape, different size of sin, not different size, different shape, different texture, but you will find sin. Um, here's a mass grave found in what would be modern day Illinois, and it looked like, if you look at the bottom there, they may have been drugged and strangled before burial, all before a single uh, colonialist stepped foot, European stepped foot on the, on the land mass. Uh, again, Ritual violence and warfare is, was commonplace. Uh, the Aztecs, if you go to South America, I was, I was showing you North America, in South America, and you see this, the Spanish explorers have records of this, you know, human sacrifice. So the surrounding peoples around the Aztecs and some Mayans were terrified. Why? Because you could get snatched at any given time and sacrificed to improve the weather and have your heart torn out and your head dribbled down the staircase. The movie by Mel Gibson, Ap Apocalypto, is quite true to form, so it's actually historically based. And a little closer to home, do you guys know the, what used, we used to call the Queen Charlotte Islands is the Haida Gwaii Island? Uh, they were considered the Vikings of the Pacific Northwest because they would do flash raids, they had better navigation than the other Coast Salish, so they would rush in, they would basically rape, plunder, kill, and enslave the Coast Salish people. And they were, they were hard to get because they were fortified on their own island, it was hard to get over there, it was hard to surprise them. So who, by the way, ended the Coast Salish slave trade? The European colonialists. Can, can we not get some credit for some of the good that we've done, right? But now, for about 250 years, we had what would be called the, the um, sorry, Indian American Wars. Now, for 250 years, the colonialist Americans had conflicts, a series of conflicts, with the indigenous. Uh, wounded Knee is often cited as an egre egregious violation by the U.S. towards the indigenous. And by and large, I would agree with it. So what happened is, as there was a lot of distrust between the, the indigenous and the American colonialists, some of that is just plain old inevitable. When you have that much of a moral difference between two cultures, no language connection, and a lot of suspicion, you're going to have conflicts break out essentially for no good reason. So that's, that's a bulk of what happened in the original meeting of the, two, of the two civilizations. But as they stayed longer, as they played themselves out, they began to get to know each other. The American Indians, by and large, learned English, especially their leaderships, and they began to form treaties, willfully, with the American government. So in some cases, like with the, the Sioux, in, uh, in the, what would be today South Dakota, they established a, an area where they had all, were given all their traditional lands and given autonomy over that land by the U.S. government. Now, unfortunately, in one section of that part, the Black Hills, 
prospectors, American prospectors, who weren't supposed to be there, found gold. So now there was a vested interest in mining that area. So through a weird series, and we've seen this in modern politics, of meandering talks and rewritten ag agreements, the U.S. was taking part of the Sioux Reservation back. And the Sioux were saying, well, well, no, this is actually some of our most sacred land traditionally. And they go, well, you know, this, it's just the fine print, and I don't know what to tell you. That was European sin, which is not as bald-faced and aggressive as, let's say, indigenous. In indigenous, you, you cross them, they just killed you. And there was this degree of honesty and courage in that kind of uh, and, and that behavior. With the Europeans, though, they kind of just molested legal language and got what they wanted. So anyway, so the Sioux were pushed out of there. It caused distress, and there was a movement within the Sioux tribes called the Ghost Dance Movement. And some of their prophets were saying, if we continue in this tradition of these ritualistic dances, our f ancient fathers will come and give us our land back. So word got around, and not too long after the beginning of the dance, ghost dance movement, there had been a conflict between Custard and the Sioux in this region, and the Sioux had won quite decisively. So the U.S. military was kind of weary of the Sioux because they were powerful warriors. So when they kept seeing this movement growing, they saw it as a building insurrection. So they went to squash the movement, they made the movement illegal, on grounds that were supposed to be autonomous for the Sioux. So the U.S. broke the reservation agreement and started to police their behavior, their religious behavior on their reservation. Does that sound familiar in this day and age? That the government would give itself the kind of power to take individual groups' autonomy away from them, right? Anyways, they, there was a corralling of Sioux by the U.S. military in a city called Wounded Knee. And w they were disarming the Sioux, they were arresting some Sioux, and a fight broke out, and about 30 soldiers died, and 200, 200 Sioux were killed as well. So there was a combination of misunderstanding, but definitely funky behavior on part of the European Americans in their dealings with the Sioux. We have to own that stuff. We're not sin-free just because our skin is paler than the, than the indigenous, right? So we, ha we can look at history completely bl nakedly and come to terms with it. The Trail of Tears was a more egregious violation. The Cherokee, uh, the, so here, a handful of tribes, it was the Choctaw, the Seminoles, the Cherokee, etc., were given a huge swath of land by the Andrew Jackson presidency, during the Andrew Jackson presidency. And then, unfortunately, prospectors came in and discovered what? This was, in the 1800s, there was a whole spat of gold rushes throughout the U.S. By the beginning of the 1900s, the U.S. had about two-thirds of the world's gold in its borders. So there was a lot of money to be made on parts of these reservations. So again, the same process took place, and unfortunately, the presidency went along with it, they rewrote some laws, and they forced about 100,000 different, 100,000 indigenous to walk a 5,000 mile course over nine states, pushing them out and reneging on their reservation land deals. And about, I think something like 10% of them died on the way, or 15% of them died on the way. I mean, imagine getting your old and your sick and your newborns to go on a nice little walk for 5,000 kilometers, right? And it was forced, it was illegal, and it was a reneging of a treaties. Indefensible, you cannot defend that. So colonialism, inherently isn't wrong in the beginning with a completely blank slate North American continent that was barely populated. The chicanery happens when you start doing things like this. Now, that's not the only thing we did and it's, we're not the only ones who violated the other. Indigenous could be excessively violent and they did have a more barbaric culture. The Catholic missionaries who came to Quebec in the 16 and 1700s uh, many of them were captured, tortured, and killed, and some of them who weren't witnessed how the Hurons and the Iroquois, for example, treated their prisoners of war from other tribes. A common practice was to tie someone up, pour boiling water on their flesh over and over again, to, and then scrape their flesh away as it basically melted off their body. There, and they did this at times completely unprovoked. There was sin on both sides continually. Do you see the picture? Do you see the difference between that picture, the nuance, versus what you commonly get preached at on television, through movies, and in K through 12, through university education nowadays? 
We are, we are Darth Vader, and they are the Rebel Alliance. The, the, it's black and white, so to speak, in the common critical race theory saturated culture. Now, closer to home, Canadian residential schools. Now, what's interesting is I, as I looked through this, and I should have had Bruce come up here, Bruce worked as a, he's a professional researcher and he gets contracts with the government at times. And you worked on the residential school uh, statistics for 10, 15 years, didn't you? Yeah. It's, I had, actually had a lengthy discussion with Bruce at one time on the specifics of residential school program. Now, it turns out that the British North America Act that we signed in 1867 and the Indian Act of 1876 we f went into a willing agreement with the indigenous leaders across Canada, which, which is something they wanted. We promised that we would supply their youth with a first world education. That was seen as in everyone's best interest. We had no ill will inherently towards the First Nations in Canada. We didn't have the same conflict levels that they did in the States. And we wanted to create a future path of joining the two civilizations together. And by and large, and correct me if I'm wrong, Bruce, the indigenous leadership was thrilled with the idea. Is that correct, or is, is that an oversimplica oversimplification? Uh, correct. Yep. Okay, fair enough. Now, of course, what ended up happening is the government was running this by subsidizing churches to run schools. So they were centrally planning this and just but farming it out to individual uh, churches and funding them. So the churches were receiving a certain amount of money per student. There was an inherent interest in maximizing the profit of the school. So what they would do is they'd, they'd have the children do a little bit too much labor and a little too little learning in order to decrease the amount of help they had to hire, increase their profit margins. They did tend to get them to, they would cut their braids off and give them Western haircuts, Western names, etc. The idea that they were pulled forcefully from their homes is, a mytholo is myth mythology, by and large. It was inherently, it was willingly entered into by the majority of the indigenous tribes, for good reason. It made sense on paper. But in practice, it turned out to be much more difficult to quickly assimilate an old world, a completely different civilization into ours. One of the biggest negative impacts to, of the residen residential school system was the health status. The Bryce Report in 1907, it was a doctor hired by the federal government to go around and basically give a survey of what was happening in residential schools. One out of four residential school students had tuberculosis because of the poor, the damp and cold conditions in a lot of these schools. And the numbers in terms of sexual uh, abuse, the numbers I've seen that are credible range anywhere between 10 to 20%. Is that about right, Bruce? Yeah, and I looked at the current North America-wide public school sexual abuse rate, K through 12, our regular schools, Oak Bay High, Lansdowne Junior, 10%. And that 10%, by the way, both for the residential schools and public schools of, the, of modern times, isn't just teachers abusing students, it's student-on-student -student crime is counted as well. So the idea that it was a rampant uh, mental, physical, and sexual abuse in the residential schools, way over the top compared to normal, I didn't find much evidence for. Is that somewhat correct, Bruce, as an expert in the matter? Boarding schools? Yeah. Correct. But what I'm saying is the difference between the indigenous residential school abuse rate was very similar to that in any school, school system. And it's worse in boarding schools because the parents are completely out of sight, out of mind. Correct. Matter of fact, C.S. Lewis talks about the rampant sexual abuse in his high level, upper middle class boarding schools in his day, right? All white on white crime. And by the way, we keep hearing about mass graves. Be careful about, I'm not saying there are no mass graves, but I'm saying, for example, the one that uh, took flight recently or last year, the Kamloops, 215 m graves found. 
the actual lady who ran the ground penetrating radar, x-ray, sorry, uh, research actually came out and made a statement. She says, we don't know what they are. I can't guarantee you they're all mass graves. Okay, there's roots, rocks, anomalies in the ground. We don't know exactly what is in there. It may or may not be graves. And by the way, we don't know if they're indigenous or white because you go back 150 years or more, they either used wooden markers or no markers to put graves. And everyone in town was buried in the same area. So the notion that this is, again, some sort of sign of massive ritualistic abuse from white to indigenous is not proven, right? I have a hard time finding proof of that. It's a lot more nuanced than it seems. And by the way, where there is abuse, there should be absolute admission of it. And like I said, we have done our sins as Europeans in America. Slavery, the other big one. So colonialism, now slavery. And by the way, colonialism has nothing to do with our founding legal documents. Remember that. That is a very important point. The, the documents, the U.S. Constitution, Bill of Rights, the Canadian Confederacy, do not itself paste over colonialism or agree with any of the abuse that were done during that period. Slavery, last point. Now, before we go into slavery in America, we should look at slavery in general. What is one of the most ubiquitous parts of any economy, and I mean completely universally true, of parts of economy throughout the history of the entire planet? Slavery. It's as old as humanity, essentially. What is the first civilization in history to remove its own slave's economy to its own detriment? The Western world. Israel and the Western world, right? Now, the Barbary slave trade, the Barbary coast, is the northern part of Africa that forms the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. The Barbary North Africans were involved in slave trades from about the 1200s onwards. Now, just between the 15 and 1800s, how many white slaves were trafficked by the Barbary Coast pirates? There's the Barbary Coast, the northern part of Africa. It's about 1.25 million white slaves. Now, the way they acquired their slaves, by the way, were by raiding ships or coastal cities. And they went as far as Scandinavia. They didn't just do the Mediterranean borders. They went outside up to the UK, Iceland, and the Scandinavians. And over about a 300-year period, they, tra they went and stole, didn't purchase, stole forcefully and killed, but for put into slavery white people, North Africans did, to the tune of 1.25 million people. How many black slaves, African slaves, were sold to Americans and transported to America during the entirety of the transatlantic slave trade? About three to four to some, I've seen as high as 500,000, but the average is somewhere in the high 300s, thousands. Does that, does that maybe, do we see the Europeans going to Al uh, Libya, Morocco, and asking for reparations? I've never heard of such a thing. Why? Because if you play the retroactive blame game of trying to get everyone to pay for their past sins, that will never end. That is a web of an unsolvable puzzle that cannot be the way forward, or else nobody can step forward blameless. Um, the Slavs, the Slavic race. Why do we use the word slave? What came first, the word Slavic for the region or the word slave for being a slave? The word Slavic. And the reason the word English word slave, the root word for slave in Europe is from based off the Slavics is because they were the majority of the European-on-European European slave trade victims. Now, the Spanish Moors, the Spanish Muslims that came from North Africa and invaded in, I think, 700 AD, from 900 onwards, they traded in hundreds of thousands of Slavs. They went and got them and just brought them over. So again, I'm just trying to draw you the picture that slavery is not an American or Canadian sin. That is simply false. Now here's a diagram of the amount of slaves when going from Central and West Africa during the entirety of the transatlantic slave trade. And the thicker the wave, the more the people. You'll see how thin the lines are at the top left corner going to America, United States. The majority of it is going where? Central and South America, which is done by 
the Spaniards, the Spaniard conquistadors. Now, they're, if, if we reached about, and I counted up the numbers, if you get about high 300,000s going to the states, there was over 6 to 10 million that went to the South and Central America via the Spanish conquerors. Okay, Brazil alone received 3 million. Is there a movement right now in Spain to pay for reparations in Brazil? Are Brazilians who are more white-colored skin being asked to pay reparations for the darker-skinned Brazilians? No. But why not? Why not? Now, <clears throat> the founding fathers in the U.S., most of them had slaves, but they lamented that England had brought old world sins to the new world. They were talking about getting rid of slavery almost from the get-go, even as they owned slaves. Because guess what? When you're part of a time and a culture, you are very much shaped and a part of that time and culture. And one of the main reasons they didn't just act quickly, by the way, to end slavery, was that they had such a high view of private property and states' rights. Okay? They had just fought a bloody war against England to win the very country which was based on the exact opposite of a centralized, powerful government. They did not want to immediately out of the gates reverse course and force the states to do what they knew was centrally correct. Do you see that? They had a very strong, branded into their heart belief in a fully free society with autonomous states. So they said, we cannot get involved here, even though we would love to get involved here. Now, by the way, when were the first states who outlawed slavery. When did that occur first and foremost? Four states were the first to abolish slavery, which already was illegal according to the Constitution, but they amended it anyways to put it more forcefully. It was in the 1790s. Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and another state I can't remember, outlawed slavery right out the get-go, right out of the gates, okay? And only, only the southern part of the states had ever been slave states from the beginning. So here's a diagram. You'll see this changing over time. It's a time lapse from 1789 onwards. Only red states were slave states. The rest were free states or states or no long, not quite yet part. The grayed out area is not quite part of America uh, at the time of the, of the graph. So more than half the U.S. landmass has always been slave free, just like Canada was. Okay, And it is a heritage of the South is what slavery is. That's why it was in the South that discrimination lasted until the you know, 1960s and 70s. Does this paint a slightly different picture of the level, size, and scope of the sin of slavery when America has done it the least? In all the, er all the statistics we looked at, the Northern African slave trade that traded in whites, you look at the, what the Spanish did in South America, we are the least guilty of this sin. Yet which country is being hammered over and over again in the media and in culture to pay for the sin of slavery? The one who did it the least and the one who abolished it first. Isn't that interesting? Do you see the word play, the game play? Do you see the mind warp, the untruthfulness, the un unfoundedness of that claim? Critical race theory turns out to be wrong. Now, John Newton, a U.S. former slave trader turned Christian, and U.K.'s William Wilberforce were two of many people in their generation who led what? The abolition movement, the movement to end slavery. Ironically, it was white Christian men, supposedly the greatest enemy of freedom ever devised, who created a nation in which it was right out of the gates, by the letter of their own law, un illogical and illegal to have slaves in the first place, even though many did, but then they went ahead and made sure that we honored the letter of the founding documents by ending slavery, and we did. But who is the most racist person in history according to modern culture, which is drenched in what is critical race theory? The white Christian male. This is a spiritual war, folks. There's lies versus truth. Okay? I want you to know the historical truth of the landscape. I'm not abdicating us of any sins. I'm not saying that. But I want to show you the exact size of our sin, and therefore, what's the size of the remedy supposed to be? By the way, how many Americans died in the, in the Civil War to end slavery? 
more, so, more than there were slaves who were brought here. About 620,000 American soldiers died in entirety on both sides of the war to free the slaves. There was less than 500,000 slaves brought over. It, the debt has been paid in blood with some interest. Maybe that's God's math, for all I know. And if you look at, at the time of the Civil War, there's about 31.5 million Americans in America. So 620,000 is 2% of the population. In today's terms, that's 11 million people, right? Or 13 million people dying in one war to free and in, to right a wrong. Have we paid for, for slavery? Have we ever paid any price for slavery? Of course we have. We already have. Let's look at some statistics, because the one thing you keep hearing over and over again is that the, the slaves built the economy in America, right? You hear that over and over again, so they're owed reparations. Okay, let's take a look at the exact size of the contribution of slaves in the U.S. Now, in the 1600s, by the way, there were already freed black slave, blacks, and some of them, thousands of them, had their own plantation, farmland, and slaves. Okay, that's an interesting fact. In the 1860s, there were only, f by the time the, the Civil War came, at the height of the slave economy, there were only 15 slave states. And the, of in those slave states, because if you iron it out to the entirety of the U.S., is not a good way, because if you look at the entire population of the U.S. in 1860, and divide and get the number of slave owners at the time, it gives you an average ownership of slaves of less than 1%. But that makes no sense, because you can't count the freed states as states, as, as, you know, how bad was slavery? Look at the states that had slavery in them and count the number of slave owners and the number of slaves. If you do that, you get somewhere between 3 to 5.7% of the population in the slave states had slaves. So it was a minority of people. I mean, how many people do you know have massive land? It's the minority, not the majority. Um, the majority of the slave force was concentrated in agriculture, specific, specifically the production of these goods, coffee, rice, sugarcane, tobacco, cotton. Cotton, by the way, at the height of the cotton trade, the U.S. South was providing 75% essentially of the world's cotton, okay? So yeah, that was a, and it was 50% of the entire GDP of, the, of, the, of exports, sorry, 50% of all U.S. exports was cotton. Um, in the 1860s, there was 3.9 million slaves. Obviously, they breed, they have families, they have kids, and the population J-curves. So four to 500,000 turned into 3.9 million within a couple hundred years. Uh, in 1860, the GDP of the U.S. was $4.2 billion. $180 million was produced by the cotton trade. Um, 13 million came from the tobacco production, 2 million rice, 113 million from sugar. So those same industries that were slave rich in the South, driven by slave labor to a large degree, not to a full degree, makes up about 7.3% of the US GDP in 1860. Now, I don't, that's an estimate, by the way, because not all of that was produced purely by slave labor. And there were slaves involved in other minor parts of the economy or other, fractured throughout other parts of the economy. So the exact contribution is hard to pin down. I spent a long time trying to come up with a precise statistics. It's difficult. But I tried to do as good of a job as I can. And to say that the majority of the U.S. economy was built on the backs of slaves is not correct. Okay? They were a significant part. And by the way, this has nothing to do with the, the wrong of slavery. I'm not trying to say that it was okay because the numbers were small. I'm just trying to look at the size of the sin. So that when we look at calls for reparation, for example, we can put it into context. Now, after the Civil War, you had three amendments added into the Constitution, the 13th, 14th, and 15th. Abolition of slavery, the fact that the reinforcement by the 14th Amendment that the citizens were equal, all legal and civil rights were equally given to African Americans, and the 15th Amendment giving them the right to vote. Now, all of this was already in the Constitution. The amendment didn't add it to it. It just reinforced the original document and said, this makes, we have to spell this out because of the sin of slavery, but it was always a part of our DNA that all men are born free. And ethnics, ethnicities don't make a different species. We're all men. 
Now, the Civil Rights Act, by the way, guys like Booker T. Washington, who was around in the, born in the 1800s, died in the early 1900s, was a, right out of the gates, right out of the gates, black Americans who had already had, in the, in the northern states, been free forever. But the influence of southern-born blacks into high levels of academia and, and government, Booker T. Washington was a U.S. presidential advisor. He began the Tuskegee College, the Tuskegee College, um, which was produced the Tuskegee Airmen. Do you guys hear the Tuskegee Airmen? Not the, the, the syphilis controversy, but they produced in World War II. This college was made in the late 1800s, but by World War II, his college had produced a thousand, over a thousand pilots who ran uh, escort missions for bombers in World War II. They had one of the lowest rates of losing their bombers out of all World War II pilots. They were some of the most successful pilots, and that kick-started the natural increase in the military saying, we want more of these black guys. They're doing great. So the integration of blacks into the military had a huge uptick because of men like this. And he saw, he foresaw a call for things like reparations. It was already being spoken about in the early 1900s. And he was mortified by it. He, he had a famous quote which said, our parents were farmers, my parents were farmers so I could be a mechanic, we'll be mechanics so that our children can be doctors and lawyers. He wanted to see an organic rise of meritocracy to allow a pathway of all freed slaves into society through meritocracy, which is exactly how I would see it. If I look at a black person, and I, in my mind I'm like, I don't care that they're black. It means as much to me as the color of someone's hair. I expect them, given the same opportunity as me, to have as much chance of success as me. That is an unracist, that is a post-racial view of my fellow man, and it's one shared by guys like Booker T. Washington, who was afraid of the oncoming era of treating black people like they needed a helping, a helping hand. He said, as much as it might be well-intentioned, it will be disastrous. And he was correct. Here's another quote from Booker T. Washington. He called out the people that we still have in our day today way back then. He says this, there's a certain class of race problem solvers who don't want the patient to get well. Because as long as the disease holds out, they have not only an easy means of making a living, but also an easy medium through which to make themselves prominent before the public. You know what comes to my mind when I see this quote from a black man from 100 plus years ago? Guys like Jesse Jackson, you know, guys like Al Sharpton, etc. They need racism to exist because that's their business. To go around calling it out, receiving money to fight it. There's an industry, there's an anti-racist industry led by lib white liberals and black activists, which apparently was already brewing in a hundred plus years ago. Um, how about this young lady, Madam C.J. Walker? Anybody have ever heard her name? She was around, she was born at the end of the slave period, died in the early 1900s. She's the first self-made black millionaire in, US, in the U.S. And she did it through hair care products and cosmetics. So was there an inherent straight arm in the face of black Americans, even way back then? Well, no. If they stood up and participated in the economy successfully, they were rewarded. There was no inherent barring of them outside the economy. The problem does lie in when you show up and you're for 100, 200, 300 years, you're private property, you're not educated, you're not allowed into general society, you can't vote, you can't go to school, you can't own property, in half of the U.S. landmass. Well, yeah, when you get out, you're starting from behind. So there are inequalities, absolutely. And if it takes you another 100 years to have the South, the most egregious violators of human rights in the U.S., to recognize and codify into law that you can't be discriminated against, yes, you will have en masse, on average, a lower income than whites. But it wasn't part of the original DNA of our legal language. The U.S. Constitution, the Bill of Rights and the Federalist Papers. That is the point that critical race theory tries to drive home, which is false. And again, the Civil Rights Act of 64 did not invent anything new. It simply forced the South to recognize the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments from 100 years prior, which themselves were going back 100 years to 1786, or 87, when the Constitution was drafted, to remind everybody that when it says all men are created equal and have the right to freedom of liberty and pursuit of happiness, 
That meant all humanity. So it was original documentation was anti-racial. Economics, and we're almost done, folks. The welfare state that came after the Great Depression essentially incentivized single motherhood. If you were a struggling single mother, you could get paid per child in the US. Now, who does that affect the most? Poor families. If you're a well-to-do middle class, upper middle class family, you're never gonna be in this pit. But if you're a struggling poor family and you can have money per child, and if you, hey, if you have a man in the household, you can't get the, the, the benefits. But if you're not married or the person's kicked out of the household, now all of a sudden you can quite literally make a living off your kids. So anytime you reward something economically, it's one of the iron laws of economy, you get more of it. So in the, the majority of black people, more so than, than whites on average, were in the lower classes economically because of them leaving segregation and slavery recently. So what happened is it incentivized fatherlessness within the black community, which today over 70% of American black families are fatherless. That is an astronomically higher number than compared to Hispanics, whites, and other, and, and Asians in the US. Now, in the, policy, the US Policy Institute in 1991 did a study, and it's been, re, re, um, it's been also done by the United Families Foundation. When you look at fatherlessness, it predicts juvenile crime rates. And the crime rates between black and whites are essentially the same when you factor in fatherlessness. It's not a racial thing, it's a cultural thing. And that is why there is a, a huge amount of interaction between black youth, especially in inner cities in the US, and the police, right? You remember the whole defund the police movement? They said the problem here is the police messing with black people, they won't leave us alone. Well, in every city, especially Portland, which activated a defund the police policy, within six months had an 800% increase in murders. Okay, it turns out it's not the police that's the problem. It's, it's crime. How about this? Why don't we go back to not so long ago when a, the most prominent and successful black civil rights activist, Martin Luther King Jr., had a very unique concept, which was, by the way, and he would say it himself, in the Constitution itself, way back from the 1700s. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. What does critical race theory teach us to do? You're white, you're evil. That is being judged by the color of my skin. That is not the agreement we came to in the 1960s civil rights revolution. Okay, it has no, it is a cultural Marxist sinister tool of destruction and division. It has no place in a Judeo-Christian society. It has no place in a fair and just society. I don't care what color you are. I don't care what color your skin is, what color your eyes are. It's all melanin, and I don't care. And that is why our society, that's the direction our society was finally headed to before critical race theory regressed us back to tribal conflict. Thomas Sowell, anybody here know the name Thomas Sowell? Okay. Poor black kid, makes it good, goes to Harvard, becomes a, a national treasure as far as I'm concerned, an economist working at the Hoover Institute of Research. This is in 1981. This guy is basically an autistic com supercomputer mind nerd who looked just at IRS statistics for a living, okay? And he's right now going to argue against a white liberal woman about where the state of the black man economically was in 1981. It is clear from these figures, as indeed I think it's clear to most of us from what we see, that there is a discrimination against blacks and against women in our present system. Since not all blacks will be superior, how would we try to even that out so that there would be some equality of job opportunities? Yeah, I, I'm sorry you missed the earlier part of the program when I pointed out that uh, where you find uh, people not represented evenly that does not show the institutional effect because almost nowhere in human affairs do you find people evenly represented. Awesome. If, you, if you compare comparable people with respect to age, with respect to education, etc., you get a totally different picture, both with respect to blacks and women. Now, the figures that I saw, for example, show uh, more recently that if you take black families where the husband and wife are both college educated, you compare them to white families, 
for the husband and wife who are both college educated. The black family is now earning $2,000 a year more. The problem is not, the problem is that very few blacks fall in that category. That when you compare category for category, then we're talking about getting people a decent education. I'm saying that you cannot say that numbers collected at the employer's place of business reflect simply the employer's policies. Those, num those numbers reflect underlying conditions in the whole society, just as numbers collected at a hospital do not show you that people are sick because they're in the hospital. Could you guys hear what he said? It's a little muted. What he's basically saying is if you look at by education, a black educated families making more money than whites in 1981. And that employers just don't have that many of them to choose from because it's just, again, they were behind because of slavery and segregation. But once that was, and that was only in part of the US, once that was fully and finally squashed, their upwards mobility wasn't being stopped, okay? The, the top five income earners per household in the US are non-whites, okay? Asians are at the top of the list, I think Nigerians are second or third, and it goes down that way. There isn't in anything inherently stopping people that are not white succeeding in our society. In Canada, it's Chinese and Asians are the number one and two income earners in Canada, not whites, okay? It is not a perfect society that we have here, but it is the least racist society in the history of the world, and currently, its racism level is at its own lowest point in its own history, at least it used to be, I believe the comeback of racially identifying each other is a purely a factor of the growth and the spread of critical race theory, which has nothing to do with the Constitution or Bill of Rights. Now there's hope. I want to show you this last video. This is the last slide. Here's a father and daughter that give me hope because there are plenty of, trust me, I, I follow a lot of different podcasts and social media outlets. There are plenty of black people that think just like me. Not just guys like Thomas Sowell. There are regular Joe, hardworking blacks who couldn't care less either about race. Daddy teaches you you can be anything in this world that you want to be, right? Don't daddy teach you that? Yeah, and it doesn't matter if you're black or white or any color. Doesn't matter if you're black, white, brown, yellow. yellow. Right? Black. And, and how we treat people is based on who yeah. they are and not and what color nice. they are. And if they're nice and smart. See? This is, how, this is how children think right here. Critical race theory wants to end that. Not with my children. It's not going to happen. My baby's going to know that no matter what she wants to be in life, all she has to do is work hard and she can become that. Work hard even though you don't know anyone. You can make friends. <laughs> Yeah, you can make friends, no matter what color they are. So we need to stop CRT, period, point blank. Children do not see skin color, man. They love everybody. If they're good people, they love them. You have to educate racism back into the next generation. That's what CRT is doing. The same way you have to educate gender confusion into people. We grew up, did you ever sit there, how many of you truly wondered what was a boy, what was a girl? It's one of the most basic facts that we knew right off the bat. This is, has to be pumped into our children, this poison, for them to be skewed back to a tribal, divided society. It's an evil. I hate it. It's an evil. You know what the number one destination on planet Earth today is for non-whites? Here. Do they not know about the racism that's awaiting them when they get here? Because when they get here, and I, I, I talk to my patients all the time that are from other parts of the world, and They'll routinely tell me that they, we have never known racism in the West. Those who come from Africa, Malaysia, India, they go, you want to see violent racism? Where people, groups that are closer ethnically than us and non-whites, closer, they're all African races, Malaysians, uh, East Asians, who are willing to kill each other for genetic differences? The West is not racist, my friends, not compared to the rest of the world's standard. And it's not because we're, the fact is we're a value-based society. Originally, we're the most Judeo-Christian influenced political theory in history. And because Christianity happens to be the truth, it happens to give real world positive results that we've seen for two, three hundred years now. And we're being fooled, our, our young people's generations being fooled in undoing what worked. That is lunacy. That is lunacy. 
And, and this is what the, this is my next slide is the absolute last slide. The 2020 summer riots across America cost dozens of lives and billions of dollars in damage. When we, we've just looked at a bald-faced, naked statistical look at the level of sin when, through colonialism and slavery, and it existed, what we did about it, the fact that it was never embedded in our original language of our founding documents, and that we were all well on the way to eradicating it, even though we had committed it less than other parts of the world. And yet we're being told that you have got to destroy a country because of its level of racism. That is absurd. We've seen the levels that we had. The idea that we needed to destroy our economies, our lives, our entire structure, our way of thinking, our gender identity issues, our racial uh, uh, politics, because of the kind of racism we had, that's absurd. This is what they want. The Frankfurt School wanted a destruction and a dismantling of the most theistically, politically influenced culture in the history. And that's what they wanted. Completely and obviously out of step with reality. You want to see a real crazy guy come here next week? We got Cam <laughs> Brar, 6.30 next week. Musings of a madman. Um, can I get my Vanna White to come take the mic? We're going to open it up to Q&A. Just re and the reason we have a mic is so that we can hear you on the stream because it's, it's streamed and recorded on the YouTube channel. So, there's a gentleman over there. Uh, hello? Yeah, thank you. That was, that was pretty good. I have a question. Um, nature built, you know, the Asian people and the Africans and the Europeans and so on. So... I mean, I hear what you're saying, but how are we going to uh, protect them? Like, for example, I went to Scandinavia in the 1970s. You know, they have a lot of blonde hair, blue eyes, and so on. And they're a very tiny minority. If they do diversity, which they're doing now, diversity, they're going to destroy that. When I go to Japan, I want to see Japanese people. Same with China yeah. and Mexico. If we mix everything together, we destroy it. So the only way to protect what nature built, which is beautiful diversity, is by separation. But we in the West are doing the opposite. We're throwing everything together, and London, Paris, they're no longer French and English. Like, so how do you reconcile this? Because no one in the world is doing diversity except us. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you, can't, you can't make Tokyo, the Japanese a minority in Tokyo, that ain't gonna happen. Mm -hmm. Or the Chinese a minority in Beijing. So. Yep. But we're doing that here in the West, and that's going to destroy the European people, which really we're a very tiny minority. I think 9% of the world population is, is European. So how are you going to solve this? I don't want to see the end of blonde people. I mean, I like blonde people. So, <laughs> so <laughs> okay. Well, that's, a, uh, that's quite a question. I will say this. Forced diversity, like you're talking about, where that makes no sense economically, like pumping a bunch of people from another part of the world that we don't need in our, in, our, in our workforce. We have our own people that are unemployed here, right? In the US, during Trump's presidency, he made it more difficult to hire and bring over illegal undocumented workers. As a result, the, working f the work pool for given industries, especially in the lower skilled areas, was now opened up to Americans. So then the actual cost of, la the, the wages of those lower class jobs went up because you had the natural country's workers not being over competed with by an endless stream of people coming from another continent. That's, I consider an evil. That's mismanagement to have no borders. The racial purity issue, I don't really, if something happens naturally, let's say that it just so happens that uh, people are now more racially mixed in their marriages. Personally, I don't care, right? There are, if you go throughout history, you'll see different ethnicities come and go, right? Right now we do have, for example, the blonde haired blue eyed Scandinavian crowd. And yes, I think they're beautiful too. And I would like to keep them around. 
If they choose from free will to interracially mix, I don't have a problem with that. What I have a problem with, I think, is what you're speaking to is when you have a government siphoning unnaturally and illegally millions of people to cause cultural, cultural diversity itself isn't even my biggest problem. It's moral diversity. When those people come here from the third world, and in many cases in Europe, it's the Islamic third world, they have radically different views of gender identity. Do you think, do you think that we're having a problem now accepting transgenders and gays in the West? Wait till you put in 10 million jihadi-minded Muslims who couldn't care, they'll throw you off a building if, if you're gay. The safest place for a gay person and a, and a wife and daughter and children in the world is the Western world. So I don't have a problem with normal flow of genetic diversity if it's free-willed. I don't want open borders because that is a destruction on multiple levels. So the racial thing, I don't really care about as much as I love all people of different ethnicities. They've come and gone throughout history. I just, but again, if it's natural law that keeps us the way we've become, diversified, well, one way to undo natural law would be to unnaturally open borders and siphon people that are not needed economically, that are putting people that are already, you have, for example, legal migrants from South America who've come legally to the U.S., and now they have to, over, they have, they're outcompeted for because of the huge pool of illegal undocumented workers. That's not fair. I want people who are legally in a country, regardless of their ethnicity, to have a fair shot at the job market, and the government's in charge of allowing a certain amount in, because like in Japan, they've had as low as 12 net migrants in a year. They have apps, and they're focused on economics. And as a byproduct, yes, there's some sort of like homogeneity in their ethnicity. To me, that's a side, that's a side show. I don't really care about the ethnic purity but I care about good economic policy. Thank you very much. I understand that they're teaching critical race theory in the public schools now. Do you know what level, what they're teaching, that kind of thing? Uh, it's, it can show up at any level. It's permeated the minds of the teachers to such a degree that it is their worldview. Gender fluidity, critical race theory, so you've got, you've got evidence, for example, if you follow certain uh, social media channels in the US, kindergarten. Kindergartners are being told, I, you know, I'm your adult, uh, there's a TikTok account called the liberals, the libs of TikTok. And it's a conservative girl, I believe, who chronicles and puts on her channel all these liberals who are putting out TikTok videos in the US. And she's specifically getting the craziest ones. And you see a whole slew of teachers taught, you know, with pink hair and mustaches and boob jobs who are teaching kindergarten level, saying how proud they are that they're kept to introduce their students to the fact that gender is a oppressor's construct. The idea that we have genders is a form of oppression according to the critical race theorists and radical gender theorists. Radical gender theory is just as much a destructive tool of Marxism as critical race theory. They're destroying nature. When you tell me that I can be, and it's what's funny, as I think Cam was talking about in the audience earlier, what, what I love about this abortion debate that's coming up now is all of a sudden it turns out only women can give birth. Therefore, men can't have an opinion. Now we know what men and women are all of a sudden. And all of a sudden, my body, my choice has made a huge comeback. Not during the vaccine mandates, but back in, we're back in class. So part of this I'm enjoying tremendously. Any other questions? Either I taught well or poorly if there's no questions. Can I ask you a question about yes. Anthony Scruton, the British uh, political philosopher? Do you know about him? Mm -mm. Oh, he's brilliant. Um, yeah, he wrote about the new left in the 80s and then he just rewrote a book and it basically has Gramsci and all those guys in there. A friend of mine uh, highly recommended it. So Anthony Scru Scruton, mm. he's a British conservative who just uh, passed away about two years ago. Okay. Who's the gentleman who wrote, the atheist who wrote about the Judeo-Christian um, influence of the West? He wrote a couple of years ago. He was, he was, he'd written a book on how uh, Islam had had a destructive streak throughout civilizational history. 
And some of his liberal friends, because he was an atheist, says, hey, why don't you look at the destructive nature of Christianity in European history? He goes, yeah, good idea. So he starts his research, and long and behold, he comes up with a book saying, no, actually, Christianity is great for civilization. So atheists are some of our best friends when they do honest work. And Douglas Murray is a British, he's a gay British guy who is one of the most the brilliant apologists for Judeo-Christian Western civilization. Because as, as a gay man in Europe, seeing Europe invaded by more and more, they're on track in, in, in England to be 40% Muslim by the year 2050, I believe, right? So a gay man gets nervous in no circumstance, right? And they start to recognize who their allies are. Judeo-Christian West is the safest place to be, whether you're transgender, gay, a woman or a ch- anybody who's vulnerable in the rest of the world. Is that historian Tom Cotton? Is that or something like that? I can't remember his name, unfortunately. Yeah, I can't either, so hang on. Who trained Malcolm X? How did he get those ideas? Mm-hmm. In this, the Frankfurt School was hugely influential in the marginalized communities, right? And there were tons of intellectual blacks in, these, in those communities. The Nation of Islam was a huge influence in the prison population in the U.S. during that time. They, had a, they made huge inroads before we ever thought of doing that with Christian ministries. And they was, they was, the Nation of Islam was just as much of an enemy of the West as the Marxists. So strange bedfellows were made. Great. One of the other things I was just going to mention real quick is a lot of people have confusion with respect to the southern states. Most of the slave-owning states were all Democrat states. They weren't Republicans. There's a mythology that it were all Republicans who owned slaves, and that's not the case. And uh, it's uh, one of the myths that's been perpetrated for a really, really long time. And Roosevelt, when he did the New Deal, is what really destroyed it, because if you look into the 30s, the African Americans were doing phenomenally well, very successful. And uh, if you are somebody who has a, uh, you know, like Margaret Sanger, the uh, founder of Planned Parenthood, she considered uh, people that were African and stuff like mongrels inferior. And if you look at the abortion clinics, they're primarily in poor inner city. And about 86%, I think, of the uh, of their clients are single black women or black women in general. Yeah, as a matter of fact, the Ku Klux Klan is synonymous with the birth of the Democratic Party. They were one and the same, right? So the Republican Party is the party of Ab- founded by Abraham Lincoln, the abolitionist, and the antithesis to his party was the Democratic Party slash Ku Klux Klan. And all these southern states were the last to give the constitutional rights to their black population, which is, again, this is how weird the world, the clown world in which we live is. We're told that it's us conservatives who are the enemy. We have been not the enemy for a very long time. And I'm tired of it. Why is a white man talking about critical race theory? Because I'm the main, main accused in critical race theory. And in what country is the accused not have the right to self-defense? Right? So I bank at um, um, one of the banks in town, I won't say which one, but I take our deposits from the business I work for and I go in and I wait in the lineup and I watch the screen in front of me and it is inundated. And I'm, I'm just going to say, I have multicultural people in my family, my children, my grandchildren, and so, you know, I don't have that, I'm not prejudiced. <laughs> Um, but I'm watching that screen and everybody on that screen is from a different ethnic background. Mm -hmm. And I've watched it several times and I've thought, you know, that's the critical race theory on that screen. Yep. So my question to you is, what can I do? Who can I approach? That's a level I can perhaps make a difference. Yep. So... You always start with the bank manager. (laughs) 
it. Or you mean to make a difference at your bank. Yeah, go to Ugh. the bank. Like you can, but he'll look at you right through you and go, well, look at this racist prick, and how can I get her money out of my bank? I don't know. No, no. I'm going to go take my money out of the bank. Oh, well, there you go. That's with, one way you can do with it. With the story that sure. there's this, and there's this, and there's yep. this, and that's why I'm cutting my business out of your 100%. Bank, which is not going to hurt them because I'm not a rich woman. I mean, that, that's why we, be, we dropped Netflix and Disney+. Plus. Right. We're like, we're going to vote with our wallet first and foremost. Then the next thing you can do is take those closest to you and try and plead with them with reasoning yeah. to be like, look, this is madness. A friend of my life, my closest friend growing up is non-white. And we've taken divergent paths in our belief system. And he is convinced that I'm quite racist because of my conservative views. And here's a person that we were basically brothers growing up, and he's non-white, 100% non-white. And I'm sitting there looking at him going, you're going to look me in the eye and tell me that race was ever an issue between the two of us? And there was that moment of him re having that cognitive dissonance of realizing I'm one of the best friends he's ever had and he still likes and yet he has to assume that I am one way because of my, the association in our media of conservative, white, Christian, boom, that's the, the worst person. That's the worst hombre on earth or in North America. And the fact that I am who I am from personal experience with him. But it, even in that circumstances, there's a struggle. I don't know which, I don't know which side's gonna win. It's incredible. So I do have another question regarding um, the whole, um, you know, where our children are being educated in certain mindsets at a very young age in our school. So my grandchildren are in grade one and two, and I'm hearing it from them. So um, where, what can we do to influence that area? Well, the num one of the, besides voting with your wallet in business, which is a great idea, schooling them alternatively. We homeschooled our children. Uh, one of them's passed beyond the, the, the doors of the house. Three others are still in, trapped in our brainwashing scenario here. But next year, my wife, in conjunction with this uh, church, is gonna have a, a uh, homeschooling or an alternative schooling center here. So sh my wife is right there, that's Becky right there. So if you wanna talk to her in the lobby afterwards. Right. Yeah, she does. She does need to be applauded. Yeah, okay, thank you. A friend of mine is a, um, he's a pension fund manager and he is with a big bank and they've recently made the rule that within five years, 25% of people at his level have to be a visible minority. Mm -hmm. And he has a problem because what's gonna happen is if somebody does happen to have a different color skin, when they get hired, all the people working with them are gonna wonder, is this guy any good? Is this person any good? Or they get hired because of the color of their skin? And that person, if they're great, everyone's gonna be thinking that about them. It, yeah, it's not so good. And I've I got another story. So one of, my, one of my best friends, in fact, he was my best friend. You know, you get best friends in for a while. Anyway, he was my best friend in about grade, from about grade five until about grade nine. We were always together. I saw the movie Green Mile, I think it's called, or yeah. Green Book. And it shows, like, this musician who goes into the southern states and how terribly he was treated. And that took place about the same time that his family, j just before that, his family moved to Saskatchewan. His father got a PhD in geology, and he wanted to get a job in the States, but just he couldn't, and he got a job in Saskatchewan, in Regina. So he moved his family there, and um, I just thought, wow. So about that time, is that the kind of stuff that his parents and his family experienced? And um, and I just thought, man, like, were we, did we treat you badly, like, growing up here? Like, like were we, like, did you feel like you were getting, you know, prejudice against you? Like, 
I, like I phoned him up in Saskatchewan, like, Albert, like I really feel bad about this. Like, how did you, how did you experience growing up? And he says, no, are you kidding, Dave? I never experienced any racism. Man, you experienced the racism. You're getting the shit kicked out of you all the time. And that's what he told me, right? Mm. So I was, it was really good because I, like, I, I had no idea. Like, I don't know. Like, I, I, you know, but he didn't. Yep. So that was good. Yeah, and Booker T. Washington was afraid of exactly that scenario. He said, we will be eyed suspiciously if we don't go through meritocracy. And Thomas Sowell, the guy that we just showed the video of, the black economist, he said he was actually allowed into Harvard on the first waves of affirmative action. He is a naturally brilliant guy. He goes, I have the goods, but I didn't grow up like these rich white kids who had been to the best schools, had the best tutors, etc. So I barely made it out of Harvard, not because I'm not smart enough, I was underprepared. So the equivalent would be, let's say you have two guys that are naturally athletic for a sport, one of them is groomed for that sport their whole lives, and another one's thrown in there at the end of the, the, the line with little to no training. The one with training is gonna beat out the one or be ahead of, and he goes, but a lot of the affirmative action first waivers that were black failed. So then what you're doing, even though you might have a good intention, is you're creating in the mind of the public and the black community that they're less than, which is an evil. It's an evil that Booker T. Washington, 120 years ago, says don't even start this evil. We'll get there on our own accord, which is the way it should be. I mean, I don't see a lot of affirmative action, for example, in sports. Do I, do I need more short white guys in the NBA out of affirmative action? I don't want to see that. I want the best product, right? And when I go on an airline, you're right. If I go on an airline, because which airline? Is it American Airlines that promised that in the next 10 years they'll have some, some quota of non-white pilots? Well, I'm already afraid to fly. Guess what's going to happen? I'm taking the train from now on. <laughs> yeah, paralyzed pilots, deaf, blind, and paralyzed. <laughs> I mean, why not? Yeah, just, uh, you, you said before that you, you're not sure why this is happening. I, I have a theory, I'm not sure if it's true, but... Sorry, hold on. I'm not sure why what's happening. You said uh, a few minutes ago that uh, the CRT and all this is happening. You're not sure why this is happening? I never said that. No, okay. This whole That's lecture good. was about why it's happening. Okay. Okay. I better know why it's happening. <laughs> okay. Um, You're misquoting me. Okay, my, uh, my error. Uh, my, my theory is... I'm trying to put myself in the, the uh, globalists. They want to form a one world government. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to think what they think. How do they do this? How are they going to do this? And so, and I think, I'm not sure, but I think to pull this off, the one people that will give them the hardest time on this planet are the Europeans. Mm -hmm. Asians are smarter, have a higher IQ, in Asia, there's a saying, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. But the Europeans are much more individual thinking. We, yep. we invent stuff. And these globalists, they don't like surprises. You mm -hmm. know, we could invent something that, you know. So I think that's the reason why they're targeting the West yep. for extermination by bringing in the whole world because China's not doing diversity. And that's why I think the people that want to form a one world government, if they could get rid of the European people, or most of us anyways, it makes it easier to control the whole planet. Well, they want to destroy the Western value system. So if they dilute the economy with, un, uh, you know, if you put enough people in their one country, who's working where? There's, the economy has to accommodate people for the economy to move forward. You can't inject, you know, 10% more population overnight and expect to not have disastrous consequences e economically. So what they want is they don't like a financially mentally, idealistically independent crowd, which is what the North American middle class has been. We're, we, were, we, were a, we grew up under a no centralized government, no forced behavior, private property, freedom, and we became the richest, largest middle class. And it's very difficult for anybody to rule people that are I intellectually and financially independent of government. So by ruining the economy, we're all sucking at the government teat. And that destroys our financial independence, which is all they need to do. 
And yeah, flooding us with open borders is exact. The Open Border Society by George Soros. That's the, their exact goal. You're 100% right. It's to destroy the West. Well, we're going to carry this forward with snacks. Uh, Chris, thanks to Chris for bringing out the snacks. Ask as many questions as you want. Make new friends. Thank you for coming. We're here next week with the Madman. So if you dare, come. And then we're gonna, I'm back here two weeks from now with a, we're gonna do a strategy session on what you can do with your money to inflation proof your money, what you can do in terms of running for local office because we need to start thinking locally and not wait for federal elections to save us. We have to get involved. And ironically, someone like me is probably far too public to ever get elected. So it may fall on guys like you that no one knows how crazy you are and you can sneak in there like little mental ninjas and make change. So it'll be a strategy session in two weeks, but next week we're back here at 6.30 with Cam Brar. Thank you for coming. Yes, thank you. Let me get off my mic so we don't say anything untowards. Yeah,